So it's 6.02. We have 31 people on. I'm going to get us started because we have a lot of great content today. Uh, my name is Josh Ramasher. I am CEO of Stalinbosch University Launch Lab. And today we have a webinar presented by the science faculty along with the Launch Lab. And this is part of our Inspire series. Um, I first off want to really thank Dean Varnick and the science faculty for being incredible partners. Um, they've really stepped up and said that they want to not only uh, talk about entrepreneurism, but also really promote it within the science faculty. So what we're doing at Launch Lab is working very closely with them to bring, bring information, bring different perspectives, bring stories to all of you about entrepreneurs, about investors, about things that are going on within the entrepreneurial ecosystem to help pave the way for you. When we talk to a lot of students, a lot of faculty, researchers at the university, one thing we hear many times is I have an idea, I have research, I don't know where to get started. And so what we wanna do through this series is provide you a bit of context about how you can take your idea, how you can take your research and turn it into something pragmatic and actionable. So I would say the science faculty has really committed to that. Launch Lab and Innovus are here to facilitate that. And today we have Ben Luce, who is an entrepreneur, a researcher. I wouldn't even say researcher turned entrepreneur because he's still doing both sides of that. Um, and also Dr. Nick Walker. So I want to kick us off today. Um, first off, just a couple of house rules. You'll see at the bottom of the screen a button that says Q&A. Uh, if you click on that Q&A button, you can put a question in. We're going to go through a little bit of a fireside chat this afternoon and then hopefully have about 20 minutes for audience questions. So please feel free to put anything in that Q&A chat and we'll try to get to it at the end of the session. Um, today, we're going to hear about 10, 15 minutes from Ben about his journey and really giving you all a bit of an understanding of how you can take things you worked at with at the university and turn them into spin out companies and then start building that into what we at Launch Lab call world shaping. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Nick Walker from OneBio, give him about 10 or 15 minutes to talk about the path he's taken as both an entrepreneur, as an investor, someone really focused on the, the biotech scene here in South Africa and across the world. And then we'll hopefully have 10 or 15 minutes for fireside chat and to take all of your questions. So again, please put your questions in the Q&A button here at the bottom. I'm gonna give Ben and Nick both a couple minutes just to introduce yourselves and then turn it back over to Ben for some more information on his journey. So thanks for joining us. And maybe Nick, if you could kick us off. Sure, uh, thank, thanks for having me, um, Josh, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Nick Walker. I am a, a, the managing partner at One Bio Venture Studio. We're a VC a venture capital firm based here in Cape Town, um, investing in biotech startups from um, South Africa and, and across Africa. And Ben, I'll hand it over to you and then maybe just introduce yourself and, and maybe 10 minutes on your, your journey and how maybe other people who have a great idea or great research could, uh, could turn that into something that, that can live out there in the world. Sure. So yes, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining and thanks for inviting uh, us to this webinar. Uh, so I'm Ben Loos. Um, I'm, I'm an associate professor at the Physiological Sciences Department here on main campus at Stellenbosch University. And since now almost 10 years, uh, I'm leading the Neuro Research Group. Um, we focus on uh, the, the molecular mechanisms of cell death. Uh, so basically the aspects around cellular fate in cells uh, with a particular focus on neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, where we wish to prevent cells from dying, um, and a particular brain cancer, glioma, which is very resistant to the current uh, um, therapies where we wish to sensitize these cells to death. And um, so that is our, our research focus since the last 10 years. And one of the fundamental processes that we are, that forms part of um, uh, basically um, uh, cellular housekeeping is a process called autophagy. And that is what Flux is about. And I would uh, then share more about that. Great, Ben. I'm just going to turn it over to you. Maybe we can hear a little bit about your story of coming from research and, and what you're doing with Fago Flux and maybe that process of how it all works. Wonderful. Okay. So, yeah, so um, I'm the, the CEO and co founder of Fago Flux. Uh, Fago Flux uh, stands basically for two words 
autophagy, which is the self-cleaning activity of bodily cells, and flux, which is standing for a flow or an activity. And basically at phagoflux, we wish to measure um, um, the, the, this particular self-cleaning activity of bodily cells. And we are developing sensing technology um, that is enabling us to do so. So now you may ask, what, you know, what, what is the context here? So autophagy, um, the self-cleaning ability, you can compare it a little bit to, you know, um, preserving and looking after an, a specific environment. Let's say, you know, if you service your car, uh, you clean, you know, the engine parts are being cleaned and so forth. So that's, that car will be preserved better. Or imagine in the household, uh, you know, there's uh, refuse that has to be removed. So the cleaner you keep it, the better this is, this environment is preserved. The same process um, uh, uh, operates in all mammalian cells, that is autophagy. And um, it's uh, when this process fails, major diseases uh, and manifest. Um, one of them is neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease. So this is a major field uh, generally. You can imagine you know, if, you, uh, if, if toxic material builds up yeah, if you're not servicing, if the cell is not servicing itself, the cell becomes very sick and then disease manifests. So we at Phagoflux, we measure this uh, cleaning activity uh, with, with high precision, with, uh, with very particular technology. So maybe briefly to my journey, how did I get there? So on first, who is Phagoflux? So Phagoflux, we are a team of five. We are a, a really most fantastic team of colleagues. Um, uh, let me briefly introduce themselves. Uh, them. um, so Prof. Janni Hofmeier, uh, who is a biochemist and systems biologist uh, in, uh, specializing in, uh, in complexities, uh, complexity studies. Um, then the next co-founder is Dr. Andre Dutoy, who has been with me since his honors years, is now in the second postdoctoral phase, so a long relationship with biochemist and physiologist. Um, then Prof. Willy Perold, an electronic engineer, who joined us later when we developed a prototype device. And then um, uh, Prof. Peter uh, uh, Faree, who is a clinician and an engineer. So we are a, a very diverse team of colleagues um, with, with the ambition to, uh, to provide solutions for measuring this activity. Um, so how did I get here? Well, I would say uh, in my research activities, I had always a particular component that aimed to improve methods, method development. And one of the key challenges in this, in this autophagy field, uh, and those that are in the field know very well, is to measure this process. This activity is very, very difficult. And the tools that exist currently are often very insensitive, um, very cumbersome, with large error bars, very labor intense and so forth. So I had already early on a, a, the, the kind of the desire to improve methodology. And that is how we started out. So we basically um, uh, developed a particular method to measure this process autophagy. And this was then, um, you know, this could be IP protected. And that was the opening door to then bring this into now a device that could be used for, um, you know, for um, actual uh, rapid detection. Now, I would just very quickly like to indicate, so one needs to understand this autophagy process to, to get this context. So all cells clean themselves through this process, autophagy. If they fail to do so, they build up toxic material and start to die, Alzheimer's disease develops. If these cells clear themselves well, so if you exercise, autophagy increases, particular diets, autophagy increases, your longevity increases. Um, and and um, so, so the, the, hence the, the current challenge is to measure this process very accurately. 
And the first environment where this is required is, of course, the, uh, the, the research environment uh, and the drug screening environment to really perform um, highly accurate research to screen drugs, to improve the field. So we at Fagoflux, we are um, envisioning to, to provide sensing solutions for these for three distinct markets in a way, one for the research and pharma market, one for the diagnostics market, and one for the you and I kind of wellness markets. How well are you doing? How healthy are your cells actually doing? And um, and, and uh, that's basically the 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 the, the key focus. Um, so maybe what I can say lastly, um, so generally it is very important to know this autophagy activity status and current techniques are poorly equipped to know this activity so you can imagine if you don't know how well your cells are cleaning themselves you're in, not in a good position to control this process to manipulate this process for the benefit of health and hence that that is the solution that that we are um, aiming to provide. And so, yeah, so it's been a, 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 um, a most fantastic journey that started 10 years ago and um, that led to method development, to prototype development that gave, gave us the confidence to say, we have now something that we could actually develop on and bring to a market. And, um, and it's highly valuable that we ourselves are, of course, the users, right? We are the researchers in, in the field. So we are, in that sense, very strict critics for this, uh, uh, for this device. And, uh, and, and hence, that is um, a very useful, we think. So yeah, maybe that's so far as a, as a point of departure. Um, and and uh, maybe there is more interest or questions uh, that then, can give a bit more detail what is of your interest in that. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. And I'm going to turn over to Nick in a second, but even just a, a quick question just about how you got started on this. Like if you had that idea, where do you go? Where, where, what is the first step in your, your journey? Who do you speak to, to to begin the process of spinning out a company? So I think the first aspect is an awareness whether a technique or whether what you're doing in research is so valuable and unique and innovative that it can be you know that it may have that it can be ip protected and that it may have a commercial value because that is important to to um to begin the journey of assessing what is out there currently and of course in the research field you know what is out there from the research side but not so much from the commercial side so to really um uh, critically assess what is out there. Is this particular aspect what you are uh, investigating or what you are uncovering patentable? I think that's the first start. And then, of course, and that's very, very important to ask yourself, what are the real needs, kind of the real pains of the potential users of what you're doing? And are you addressing these needs? And, and so kind of that, that would be, these would be very important beginning steps, I would say. That's great. And we'll have uh, more questions and more things to go over. Um, and even pragmatically there, if you have an idea and you want to get help on the patenting aspect or just understanding if there is something there, Innovis is a great first point of contact. So I'm not sure if you originally work with Madeline or Nolene or Yobear, Anita, but Really, Innovis is your first point of contact there to make sure that what you're doing is protected. Um, they also have a legal obligation to make sure that everything is done appropriately and properly. So I do just want to point that out, that Launch Lab and Innovis are very much partners and we collaborate together. But you do want to go to Innovis first and make sure that what you have is protected. Uh, make sure you don't really like screw something up in that process. And all of a sudden, this IP is now not, no longer intellectual property and also to work through some of the, uh, the specifics of the university. And maybe we could get a bit deeper into that in, 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 in a minute, but um, just want to make sure that that point is very clear. Um, is there anything to add there, Ben, or is that 
pretty helpful. That's one hundred percent correct. So uh, Inovus uh, with uh, Nolene uh, and Anita were integral part from the beginning. So they know actually our work since many years and and have been in this process. And I think that's very very important to have, you know, this also the legal the associated legal expertise um, that screens globally and and then assists you with. You know what is really uh, initially completely out of our field how to you know how to begin just drafting uh you know um, patents and, and so forth that's great cool well one of the things that we want to give everybody a bit of perspective on is there's one side of this which is taking research and trying to build a company and something that can be commercially viable i think dr nick here is a really interesting example of someone who has done a little bit of both um, nick is he'll give you his background but has been an entrepreneur and now he's an investor um, we do see, especially in biotech, a lot of very deep technical knowledge go to the investment side because you really have to understand the inner workings of these businesses. And this is why I think it's really important to bring both the entrepreneur and the investor together on a call, not only to show you that both are potential options, but coming from someone who did a lot of fundraising, was a vice president of corporate finance, a CFO, the more that you can understand your investor as an entrepreneur, and the more that the investor can understand the entrepreneur as a, a potential uh, fund, funder of the business, the better. I mean, you are partners is really the way to think about it. And I've known Nick now for, for long enough that I can say he's a great partner on this journey. So want to give him 10 or 15 minutes now, maybe talk a little bit about your journey, Nick, and also um, tell us a little bit about how you look at early stage companies as well and give people a bit of an idea how investors view the world. Cool, Josh, uh, thank you very much for, for um, that brief intro. Um, I, and just sort of to, to outline that I think that this work that you guys are doing is, is so important and I really wish that these sorts of things happened when, when I was um, at university. So a little bit about my journey. Um, I studied biochemistry and microbiology at the sort of undergrad level. I then took that forward with an honors in, in, um, in biochemistry, which I then got into um, stem cell research based in, in Peter Maritzburg. Um, or the lab that was most interesting to me at that time was doing work in, in effectively the, the effect of the extracellular matrix and the way that muscle stem cells differentiate. So I got into that lab and, and did, some, um, did, did some work there, did my master's and my PhD there. And, and during that time, um, it became clear to me that hardcore research was not where I saw myself in the long term. Um, I, 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 sort of, I, I think I didn't really have the patience for that, and I think that the the application of science was far more rewarding to me than the the type of research I was doing at that stage, which was very observational and, and you know could potentially in in twenty or thirty years turn to something um, interesting. I wanted something more kind of immediate. Um, so during my PhD, I um, sort of curiously got interested in, in where this technology was being used, i.e., the differentiation of stem cells and specifically muscle stem cells where it could be used in other areas. And what I came across was a concept that wasn't very well known then, but has become a lot more well known now, which is cultured meat. This, this was in about 2012. Um, and in 2012, I, I signed up to an organization called New Harvest, which is a, a nonprofit um, that essentially facilitates the progression towards a kind of slaughterless meat um, future where uh, the, the tools such as, as um, stem cells and, and stem cell differentiation can be used to, f to get us to that point. Um, I signed on as a scientific advisor. They were very early in their journey as a nonprofit, and, and obviously I was early in my, my scientific journey. And, and I signed on as an advisor to help sort of with um, when they got applications for certain things, kind of going through the science. Um, so I did that for a little while and, and probably within a year of, of, of that, um, me signing up and getting to know the, the founder and, and the, the CEO at that stage, um, I was approached by them because there was a company that was being formed in, in, at an organization called Singularity University based in, in the US. And this was in 2013, as I say, and they were sort of professing to be the next company or the first company at that stage to make lab-grown meat on a, on a, on a big scale. Um, and this nonprofit got hold of me saying, look, they, they, they're kind of thin on the science side. Don't you want to go and visit them in the US? And at that stage, I was a PhD student. I didn't have much money. And I put pretty much all of my savings into a ticket to go and meet these people. And that turns out, I think, to be along my journey, one of the, the kind of real inflection points. And it was very difficult for me to do at the time. 
Um, but in the end, it kind of, it pays off. And I think that the lesson I learned from that was, and, and hopefully is, is something that, that you all can take away from this, is that exposure to being uncomfortable, but being in, in situations where like, you can learn something about a world that you don't know a lot about was, was life-changing for me. So I, I got to, to Singularity University, met with a startup, and it was cl very clear that they were all, sort of more bark than bite. They had very little technical skill, but they were saying that they were going to have lab-grown meat, and bear in mind this is 2013, lab-grown meat on the shelves within five years at a price point cheaper than traditional meat. And I heard all of this and I, I sort of didn't buy it at all, but I, I really was inspired by the, the organization Singularity University and I, and I sort of said to myself, it'd be great if I could attend. Um, and fortunately at that stage, it was $35,000 to attend and I could barely afford a plane ticket to go and visit these guys. So I certainly couldn't afford $35,000. Um, luckily in, in 2016, fast forward a little bit, um, I'd finished my PhD and I had uh, got a job, a really great job as a, um, as a, sort of in business development at a biotech firm in, in Johannesburg um, where I was doing kind of entrepreneurial stuff. I'd always had this entrepreneurial um, urge and actually interestingly again in my interview for that position I mentioned that I'd gone to Singularity University and, and post me being hired I was told that that was one of the things that, the thing that stood out in the, in the interview the most is that I'd, I'd gone sort of on my own steam to, to do something like that. Um, and anyway, 2016, I was working at this biotech firm and an application came across, I think it was my Facebook feed, basically saying that Google now sponsors a 10 week program at Singularity University. So I applied and I was selected and, and so spent some part of 2016, three months in 2016 in California at this organization, Singularity University, which is essentially, for those of you who don't know it, um, they had this program, a three month program called the, the, the Global Solutions Program, which was essentially about using technology to create real change in the world for the positive. So it's their, their kind of mantra is how can we use technology to positively impact the lives of a billion people? Um, and that's sort of massive thinking, but it, it, it also allows you to create some perspective around the way that people approach entrepreneurship in, in places like Silicon Valley. Um, I came back, went back to my job um, at, at Next Biosciences in, in Joburg, but really realized kind of from a deep place within me that I needed to do something on my own and I needed to do something that I thought was impactful. Um, luckily, I'd met with my, um, who's now my co-founder in One Bio. Um, he'd gone to the, to, to the Singularity University course the year before me. So through that sort of interaction, I'd met up with him. And um, he is from an investment and finance background. He previously worked in private equity and banking. And we sort of threw around a lot of ideas, kind of curiously about what we could do next. Um, and he just actually got back from, from spending a year in Chile working on a biotech startup. So he was kind of bitten by the biotech bug. Um, I obviously had a biotech background. And we, we looked at what we could potentially do in, in, in South Africa to have impact and, and kind of try our, our small bit to change the world. So eventually I left um, uh, what was a, a pretty solid, good job um, to do something where there was really no guarantee of success. And, and essentially what our mission was, was to help in commercialize some of the really good science that happens in South Africa, specifically in biotech into translatable companies. And, and what we what we observed was that we perform really well at a, at a science level in South Africa, publications in nature and, and science are sort of symptoms of that. However, we, we don't commercialize our research particularly well. And we, what we boiled that down to were three interventions that we could help contribute to, to an improvement in that. And that was access to laboratory space that isn't um, specifically in a research facility um, or, or, or university for that matter. Um, access to business skills, um, which is something that Ben mentioned as well, kind of this, this kind of understanding of, of the translatability of the work that you're doing in, in a business sense. And then finance, there was no biotech funds, specifically, certainly not, no private VC funds, specifically focused on the nuances around commercializing biotech. So we decided that, and, and for those of you who know a bit about the sort of venture capital kind of um, uh, industry, it's very difficult to raise any type of money um, without a track record, i.e. a track record of investing in companies. And you get a track record from investing in companies from working at other investment firms. Now, my partner had a track record of working in private equity, which is kind of a later stage type deals. 
but neither him or I had had um, any experience in venture capital or, or, or exposure to venture capital. So we thought that the raising the fund part would certainly come last. Let's build a co-working laboratory space and an, and an incubator, a business incubator first, create some track record, having worked with some, some startup companies and then raise a fund in, in probably two or three years time. And what uh, in these sorts of situations, it never turns out the way that we planned. And we, we built a lab um, that's based in Woodstock. It's, it's open at the moment called BioCity with a partner of ours. And we also started an incubation program, which ran um, the first cohort last year, second cohort this year, um, again, based in, in, in Woodstock. Um, and then sort of the stars aligned and we were able to find someone who really bought into our vision and provided us with funding to create a venture capital fund. We now manage um, around about 100 million rand, um, and that is specifically to invest in, in startup companies. Um, so Mike and I, who's my partner, we've left the running of the laboratory space and the incubator to our partner in Woodstock, and we are a two-man team, and we, we specifically look for investment opportunities in South Africa and the rest of Africa in terms of, of, of biotech. Um, the way that our funding works is that, in general, we, if we like something that someone, someone's doing, um, we've got, I should take that back a step, we've got two ways to invest in, in, in companies. The first is by finding people who are working on, on interesting problems um, with using biotech to solve those problems. Um, they come with a fully formed team, entrepreneur, CEO, et cetera, et cetera, and we provide them with funding for equity in their business. Um, we hope that that company increases in value and is very successful, and we would hope to exit that um, equity or sell out equity in that company for more than what we, what we paid for it. That's essentially our business model. Um, the other way to, that we, we have um, to, to create companies that we work with is actually to create these companies internally. Um, my, my partner and I can, if we spot some IP in a university or we have some sort of revolutionary idea that we, or an idea that we think is revolutionary, we can actually create these companies in, in our actual own company um, and spin those out with funding provided from our fund. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll sort of end it there. My journey has essentially gone from being a, 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 um, a, a scientist. I was never really, I wouldn't really consider myself a, a researcher at that stage. I obviously needed to do some research, but certainly someone who had an interest in science, but an equal interest in business. Um, and I've gone from, having that understanding of, of science and the way that science works and, and, and gradually transitioning out into a more and more business type of role. Um, the type of role that I play now is one that complements my partner who's very strong on the, on the finance and the strategy side of things. I can look at the science and kind of critically evaluate some of the aspects of science and hopefully be able to identify when science is revolutionary, um, which would obviously be something that would, would, would be of interest to us. So, Josh, I'll hand back to you. I think that's that's pretty much all from from my journey side. That's great. I mean, there's a, there's a ton to unpack in there, and I will remind just uh, if you have any questions, throw something in the Q and A here. Um, one thing that I heard from both of you, and, and something that we think a, a lot about at Launch Lab, our mission is to transform seemingly impossible into world shaping. So this idea that you want to build something that can be international, can be global, could positively affect millions of people, which is obviously what Fago Flux is doing, what Nick is looking for as well. Maybe if both of you could talk a little bit about that, that global perspective and how you're thinking about that first off. And then second off, how does South Africa play into that? Why South Africa? I think that's a really important question we have to ask. So maybe Ben, if you could kick us off, that'd be um, really good to hear. Sure. Thanks, uh, Josh. Well, I think, you know, as a scientist, you are globally anchored in any case you know you know the field uh, you know the colleagues uh, you have international meetings it is actually kind of a global family in that sense and i think that is already an important first step that you know that sensitizes you to the global arena and and obviously the global needs in the particular field and then the second aspect is of course that you know we do research for you know fundamental knowledge generation that has impact and so hence you know we are kind of used to uh you know to 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 share the research with the aims to reach to reach other researchers other labs that can take it forward that have better abilities and the same with with you know with the um with findings or with uh, device technologies whatever it might be that could reach and have impact as well and i think that is for me uh, and and that's for us at at, at Fagoflux. it's an important starting point 
And then the second aspect is, of course, we wish to reach, you know, patients or people. I mean, you know, to, to have impact in that in that sense uh, is, of course, something wonderful. That is a big part of, you know, why we do research to improve certain aspects. And hence, um, hence that includes obviously the global arena. Um, so yeah, I think that that would be the starting point. And then secondly, of course, it is daunting in, in a sense because you know it's, you're now moving into a into a business context, uh, so which is very different from from a, a pure you know science approach where anything novel you present and you publish and you want to really enhance the field. Whereas here we have to actually turn back and say, hold on, what what is really needed? Uh, what do the people, what do the researchers, what does the field really require? Never mind all the advances, what is really required and what would make that actually happen to, to, to get into the market? So these would be some points of departure that uh, I, I can think about. Great, thanks, Ben. And sorry, you'll notice the uh, the room change here. It's it's bedtime at the Ramisher household, so sorry about that. Um, Nick, why don't I turn it over to you as well? Yeah, sure, um, Josh. I think that um, in terms of trying to work on on problems or or um, solutions that will positively impact a billion people or at least millions of people and globally, um, I think that to be an entrepreneur, you kind of need a big vision and a big problem and something that is impactful enough to really drive you if you if you're working towards something that's not incredibly meaningful it's difficult when times get tough to remind yourself of why you're doing it whereas if you're trying to improve the health of of you know what you know is being millions of people around the world like ben is doing it's easy to wake up in the morning when times are tough and you're running out of funding and your back's against the wall to say okay this is why i'm doing this is that i'm solving a big problem um, so I think that from a, it's almost a risk mitigation perspective from us, as well as in a, a financial thing, risk mitigating, meaning that in order to keep people motivated, they need to be working on big problems. That's our beliefs. So that's the first part. But then from the financial perspective, obviously big problems, if you solve big problems, it's generally relatively lucrative to do. So, um, I think from a, from a fundamental perspective, I've got those two angles from a, a more kind of zoomed in perspective um the markets in south africa are really small for for biotech derived products so it's it would be unwise for us as an investment fund to invest in companies that are trying to solve a south african problem or trying to solve a problem in south africa that doesn't occur elsewhere in the world um just because these markets are, are small in south africa we don't have much buying power in comparison to you know the state of california south africa is, is is tiny so we need to be looking at, at at big problems for for multiple reasons sort of on a personal front as i say to have that drive in the person to solve a big problem it keeps i, I think um them going when, when times are tough um from a, a market perspective but then also just from it's impossible for us from a a, a fun perspective to investing in companies that that have a very narrow geographical scope and, and Ben's probably heard me talk about it in, in our course called Countdown. So Countdown is design thinking, and we do a heavy dose of customer discovery. So getting out of the building, talking to customers, understanding their problems. We do a lot along entrepreneur development as well. And one thing we talk about is grit. Um, there's a great book by Angela Duckworth, a really good TED Talk. And grit is this combination of passion plus perseverance. And I think to Nick's point here, if you're really passionate about something, you're going to find a way to make it work. Um, for me personally, my, my passion has been having impact at scale that led me to the off-grid solar industry um, that's led me to launch lab. And even when I wake up and I'm like, man, this thing is really hard, you persevere because you really care and because it is something that you find meaningful. So I would say to everyone, step back and really think about what is that thing you're passionate about? And we talk a lot about not so much what product are you building, but what problem are you solving? Um, so let me ask that question to, to you, Ben, and then also to you, Nick, from both an investor as well as an entrepreneur perspective. How do you think about going out and understanding a customer problem, even once you've done a lot of research and you have something that you is your baby? How do you go out and try to pair that with a market that, that wants that, that research? Yes, it's a very good question. Um, I think 
I think, um, so for one, just briefly, the passion aspect, of course, it, it's critical. So it's a say, you know, the same kind of wow effect that you would like to see in students, you know, when you see the first time say, data set or, you know, I, my background is imaging. So I always get this wow effect if I see processes, you know, as they happen in front of me. And so, um, that that of course is, is important to carry over now i think one would hope like in our case of course um that you what you are doing as part of development meets already most of the needs that are that you think are, are out there um you know and in the sciences you of course get that sense from you know from reviewing articles and just being in the in the field but of course, it requires more. It requires really, you know, to 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 go out there and and better understand what is it really, and how much would you, you know, how much would you be willing to invest to solve that problem? Uh, you know, is it the time component? Is it the, you know, what kind of opportunity loss is presented by you not being able to solve that? And those are the avenues that you typically don't engage with as a, as a researcher. And I think it's very important that you do that if you want to, you know, stay yourself involved in the business so that you really understand the, the needs, you know, of, of, um, of your, you know, of the, of the market in that sense. How about you, Nick, from the investment side, when you're looking at these early stage investments, how, how are you thinking about that entrepreneur or the problem they're solving? I'm, I'm curious to hear yeah. your thoughts there. So, so I think that this is a problem that, that um, scientist entrepreneurs face when, when commercializing their work. Um, you know, when everything looks like a nail, you know, when all you have is a hammer, sorry, everything looks like a nail. So um, it, it's a challenge because when you're looking to solve a problem, um, that is a massive problem. Chances are lots of people are looking to solve that as well. And if you are too focused on the technology that you bring and solve that problem, you can often find yourself in trying to attach your, your, your solution to a problem. And that's, that's always the wrong way to go. So what we would say is that someone who can articulate their competitive advantage very, very well um, is, it, it makes it very compelling for us. So, so we'll often see... Um, scientists come to us with very, very tech focus. We have developed this tech, this tech, it can do this better than that, can do this better than that. And then very much sort of a lot lighter when it comes to how will the tech be used? And often they, they have a use case. This tech will be used in X, Y, and Z, but no understanding of the competitive landscape, no understanding of how this product compares to other products that do the same thing or a similar thing or... Um, are doing something different that solves the same problem. So it's very important that someone can say to us, this is the problem. And, we, and, and from an investor side, it's far more comforting when it's a problem focused pitch or, or, or narrative that comes to us from, from a, a, an entrepreneur rather than a tech focused pitch. So it's important tech enables solutions, but the solution is only as relevant as the problem as well as it fits the problem. So have that problem focus and what, what we kind of, um, what we were taught at Singularity University was that the first thing you should do is identify the problem you're going to solve and then identify which tech best is suited to fix that. And that's difficult for a scientist entrepreneur because in general, you have biases towards whatever science you've developed or, or helped develop or have been exposed to. So it's very difficult to take this sort of abstract view of going, there's a problem in the world that I want to solve. I don't care what technology solves it. I just want to solve it. And that's, that's when you have the best chance of solving that problem. The challenge is that we all have biases and, and that's particularly the case with scientists. So I'd say from an investment perspective, just to sum up quite a long-winded response to that, is identify that your technology or breakthrough or company is well suited to solve a specific problem and be able to articulate how that technology or solution provides you with a competitive advantage to anyone else who's doing anything similar to try and solve the same problem. Yeah, I keep coming back to this definition of a startup, and we, we think a startup as a temporary organization searching for a scalable and repeatable business model. So you are out there literally searching. You're temporarily small. Not everyone wants to stay five people in a garage for forever. You want to get big eventually, but you stay small so you can be lean, you can be agile, you can pivot, but you are effectively searching for that solution. 
And the real question is, do you understand the customer problem? Are you uniquely situated to solve that problem? Are you super passionate about solving that problem? And then it's really important not to really think too narrowly early on about what the solutions to that problem can be. And I do think that is something to keep in mind from the university. People have great technology that they've built, but the wrong way to build a company is to build tech and then go search for a market. Um, the right way to do it is to understand a market and build a solution for that. I think that's a lot of the work that we're doing with Ben and, and teams similar to Fago Flux is to say, you have incredible tech. How do we then pair that with a market? How are we finding ways to iterate and move around the amazing work that you've done in order to find what we call product market fit? So we, we have some great questions here coming from our audience. The first one I'm going to go to is from Lohan. And he basically says, how did you both go about assessing risk? So I think there's always a personal and professional aspect of this. Maybe you could talk to both, um, especially for yourself, Ben. How do you think about assessing the risk of being part of a startup? And then maybe, Nick, how do you think about risk in terms of investing in companies? That's an excellent question. I think for us, it was the case that because, you know, we have been gradually building, you know, building the knowledge base and, and uh, a method and the prototype device we knew being embedded in the fundamental science field that we have to move forward like uh, the you know the need is there we are onto something important we have we have to uh, you know we have to move forward in identifying the next avenues and and yes that of course it comes with a you know the risk because you, you in the end you don't know how you know how your whatever you're doing is perceived but for us being you know anchored in the in our particular field for me it's in the automated cell death field that is a, that is in a sense a bit of a risk mitigator and then of course it's a matter of making something that is realistic achievable and kind of take it step by step. And you know, you're very right um, choosing what is actually uh, uh, needed. You know, as an example, you know, we often think, you know, we need to reach the patient. We need to, you know, we need to be quickly with the with the patient. But actually, to 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 reach the patient, the clinicians know very little about the sphere that we are in. So we have to actually reach you know, the, the, the pharma and research environment first, fundamentally, in order to reach. So there is a lot about thinking of how do you actually build your, you know, your you know, the progress in that sense. And that I think all in the context of risk, you know, helps you at least to build it step by step in, in, in that sense. Yeah, very helpful. And I, one of the things I, I always point to, on the, at least on the personal side, is that there's this, I think I think of a fallacy of risk. I mean, people can think that working with all due respect to the university is riskless. You can think about working at a big corporate. If you work at NedBank or Old Mutual, you're without risk. Um, I found in my career working on Wall Street that you're a number. Um, I went to entrepreneurism partly because I lived through the financial crisis and saw really good people get let go because the bank had to cut 50% of its employees, 25% of its employees, whatever, even if you were good, you didn't control your risk is what I realized. And so for me as an entrepreneur, I like to bet on myself. I like to bet on the fact that if I produce something and I do it well, that I can control my risk and I can win. If I don't, it's my own fault. So I think that's something to keep in mind there in terms of your own risk assessment of whatever you're doing. And people think entrepreneurism as inherently risky, but it's you have to really think about both sides of the equation and understand what risk you're taking. So I think it's, it's really important to hear Ben's perspective there. Um, Nick, maybe more from a even investment perspective, what are the ways that you assess risk? How do you mitigate risk? Or how do you think about even financial instruments that allow you to take risk um, hand in hand with the entrepreneur? Yeah, I think this is a good question. And I think the question um, is specifically around valuation of companies and the risk. Uh, how do you, how do you kind of value that risk? But I think from a, a fundamental perspective, when we're looking at the very early stages of a business, which, which is where we invest, we look at things that are most likely to end the company in tears. So it's less likely to be things like the technology, although that is very important. It's more likely to be, is this company mission-driven with a really good team? And if it's a mission-driven team with a, a mission-driven, so, so that they've got a very clear vision of, of something big, 
and the team is very strong and they've got uh, materials within that team having worked together, known each other for a long time, that reduces what we think is the risk. Certainly it doesn't reduce the risk of the product that they're pitching to us from failing. That product may fail, but the chances of them pivoting successfully increases exponentially with the amount of time they spend together, how passionate they are about doing something in the space, et cetera. So risk mitigants and investing we see as being a really strong type team that are super mission driven. The tech stuff is less important at that stage. In terms of, of valuation of companies, I think this is something that we're in a fortunate position being a very early stage investor that to, to be frank, we don't need to do. Um, it's very difficult to do. And so we defer that and we defer that by using instruments that are called convertible loans um, or safe notes um, is another, another type of convertible loan. Whether what we do is we, if we provide your company with, say, I'll, I'll give a kind of working example. We provide your company with a million rand. We don't want to say how much your company is worth. So we don't want to say your company is worth 5 million rand. So we can get 20% of your company because to be honest, it could be worth 50 million or it could be worth 2 million. So that range goes between a few percentages to 50% of your company is what our million rand could buy. And we don't know how much it's worth. And no one knows. The founders don't know. Generally, the founders think it's worth $2 billion on an idea stage. And we think it's worth 2 rand. So we defer this decision to for as long as we can. We put given a million rand, we, we give you 1 million rand to do whatever you need to do. And that's why you've raised this money. And we say, we're not going to value your company right now. We're going to value your company at a later stage when other investors come in, when there's far more substance to the company to get a more accurate valuation so that we both don't lose out. I don't get too much of your company or too little, and you don't give away too much or too little of your company. So if you are in a position where you have a company and you're in the early stages, speak to investors about these types of instruments because they do protect both sides. What traditionally happens then is that because I'm the earlier stage investor or very early stage investor, and I'm putting in this type of loan instrument, when it does convert to equity, when the company is eventually valued, so let's carry on with this working example, I put in a million rand, in two years time, you've got some sales, it's easy for us to value the business, and the business is objectively worth 10 million rand. That would mean my million rand is worth 10% of your business. Instead of me getting 10% of your business, because I put that early risk in when there was nothing known and there was a good chance that the company might fail, I get a discount. So instead of getting 1 million rands worth of equity, i.e. 10%, I may get 12 or 13%, something like that. You generally get a, a 20 to 30% discount on, on your, your investment. So there's a bit of an upside for me having taken that, that very early risk. So that's how we, to be honest, and it's a bit of a nothing answer, we don't value companies um, because it's very difficult to, to assume this risk. It's far easier the later and later down the road a company gets with more kind of objective numbers in the business, et cetera. Yeah, it's a, it's a great example. And, and really, there are very established mechanisms to do all this. Um, it is a very robust market. Um, I'm going to go into Nyasha, Nyasha's question here because it speaks a little bit to this as well. If she says, if you want to commercialize your science research, is it then necessary to pursue a formal education in business? Um, I'm going to probably lead my talk my own book here a little bit at Launch Lab because I can't do any chemistry or coding or engineering, but I've done business for a little while. But I'm going to Throw that over to Ben and Nick here and say, how do you think about pairing? Does a scientist need to get an MBA? Do you need to know every, all the ins and outs of a convertible note in order to be successful? Maybe like to hear your guys' views there. Nick, should I kickstart, yeah? Yes, uh, uh, George, as you were speaking, I made a note, focus on what you're good at. And, uh, you know, in, in your team, you know, make sure that what everyone is good at, that is for one, you know, that is maximized. So I think it's probably really fully dependent on the nature of your business. Um, it, um, I think there is certainly a great deal that you need to learn if you want to be part in driving your business successfully. Um, and that's probably varies, you know, it might be that people say, you know, I, I do this part, but I hand over the, this, these major aspects to someone I can outsource. In our case in Pegoflux, for us, it's so important that I actually realized this in this process going through, you know, with, uh, you know, with the launch lab through the various courses to actually be able to be in contact with your customer is incredibly important. And these nuances of what is really required and how could we, you know, and then you, together with your team, you respond to these for me, that is very important. So in that sense, there um, you, 
it is favorable to have uh, additional business skills. Um, whether you need an MBA, it's, it's really case to case, probably dependent, but you need to be willing to have the expertise that one, someone can assess how is your company growing and developing and is that now the right time to pull in that expertise um, or, 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 or change other aspects. So I think after all, if you want to you know, reach the market and there are so many aspects that would require really high end skills that we don't have, then you know, a decision has to be made. As for me personally, I'm a scientist, you know, I'm in the field um, and it's very important for me to drive the field, to continue to drive the field but now with this additional angle, and we have to see how things evolve, uh, what, what would be required, what additional expertise we have to approach uh, in the future. Um, but for now, we are, you know, with the support system we have, we are, um, you know, in a, in a good position. We, we believe. So I, I think this is a great question. I think that, um... It's, it's very, I remember being at the stage where my, my degree was coming up and I, I wanted to be in business and I thought that the best way to do that was to, to get some sort of business um, uh, formal qualification. And what I would say to that is that I, I view it slightly different now in that I haven't needed one to be at the point where I am, but I certainly have big blind spots. Um, so that it certainly would be valuable, I think, if I had, but would I spend two years of my life uh, having done some sort of formal qualification or would I get out and st start trying to build something? Um, I'd probably want to get out and start trying to build something. And I think that from this, the perspective that I now take from the investment perspective, we would far rather see two people coming in, one with financial and business skills and one with the science skills trying to build something in, in, in biotech than one person who's trying to cover everything. Um, there are very few people in the world who, who have the ability to, to, to have the, the kind of bandwidth to be single entrepreneurs. And that's, something we haven't touched on here, but I, I know it's something that Josh, I think, agrees with, is that team-led uh, businesses are far more likely to su succeed, I think, than, than individual businesses. So my suggestion would be be aware of your blind spots and try and get complementary skills at the early stages to join you. Uh, critically, people who share your vision and people who you know you can build for a lifetime with. But I wouldn't say that it's important for one person to have all the skills necessary to build a business. That being said, where I know I am going to pursue some more education in the role that I'm in now is in something like accounting. So hardcore finance, I think, is, is important to have. If you want to be at a high level of any business, it's important to understand the way that accounts are done, um, the way that balance sheets are drawn up, and the way that, that profit and losses are, are, are calculated. And it's something that I'm learning a lot more from my partner. I'm lucky that he, he does that for now. But um, it's just an important skill to have, I think, because it puts a different perspective on what you're trying to do when you really can see the numbers. So accounting would be one thing, but I don't think that that requires a long degree to do. Yeah, and I joke a little bit that I'm, I'm talking my book because I, th I do think this is where incubators can be really helpful. Um, so I, like I said, I'm not a scientist. I can't code anything. I can't really build anything, but I know that I can help be, com com I can add something to a team. So every team is about comparative advantage, as Ben said, do what you're good at, try to fill in holes where you, you can't. Um, I, I, one of the best comments I heard at, at one of my own, um, I heard Ben Horowitz, who's the, one of the founders of Anderson Horowitz, a big VC firm in the Valley, talk. And there was the CTO, this guy from the engineering faculty who stood up and said, I have a question. He said, I'm right now, I have a startup, I'm the CEO, the CTO, the CFO, I'm everything. When do I start hiring other people? And Ben just said, whenever you find someone better at it than you. And I thought that was great because that's scale, right? If I can bring in, frankly, Ben, who knows way more about science than I can as my CTO, then I've just added scale to my business. If I can bring in Nick, who knows way more about uh, the, the technical aspect of something to my business, then I've added scale. Um, you do want to wait, though. You want to make sure you are lean. You want to make sure that you have the ability to find that product market fit and stay very, very lean early on. Um, so Peter Thiel says a startup is the least number of people possible in order to figure out how to get your product to market. So I think that's where a, a business incubator can really help. We, we can come in and help work on some of the areas that you don't have the proficiency and get you from zero to one pretty quickly there. So um, something I think that can be outsourced. 
I would say to, to Nick's point though, if there's something that you want to know, if there's something you think will give you confidence, go online. <laughs> there's so, so many resources online about this stuff too. You can watch a quick accounting video. You can watch a quick convertible note video and get pretty smart pretty quickly too. I'm, I know we're running short on time. I'm going to ask one more question here because I think it's very relevant. Uh, Carl asked, can you talk more about the academic inventor involvement as a product, go, product or service goes to market and develops? What are the challenges or benefits of having someone from the academic sphere involved in the commercialization process? Um, so really core of what we're doing here. Um, maybe both of you could talk to that and then we'll, we'll unfortunately call it a close tonight. But, but what, is, what are the challenges and benefits of having someone from the academic sphere attempting to commercialize their research? Should I kick start quickly? Yeah. Uh, so, well, I mean, you know, in one, on the one hand, that is what we're doing, but what uh, I'm noticing is, of course, you need to be, on the one hand, it's, it might be incredibly powerful to bring your knowledge base, you know, and, and the realm that you, the, you know, the um, segment, the customer segment that you want to reach, uh, if you understand that well, that you take that with. But um, on the other hand, of course, one needs to be aware that in the, you know, in academia, we are thinking, you know, around advancing knowledge and, you know, sharing this knowledge, publishing it fast, you know, being in, as part of this and, and whilst in, you know, on the product market fit kind of scenario, it's, you, you really have to think, is this idea actually useful or this, this at highly advanced, or will it only be five people in the world that actually would like to take that up? So it takes really a slightly different approach and either one is able to do that or you really need to bring in expertise for that step to assist your company with that. Um, but and, uh, my last comment, uh, Josh, I fully agree, you know, this lean, you know, to be able to focus is incredibly important and to have a tight team that you can, you know, focus um, milestones, next steps, engage, execute. It's very, very important uh, to, to, to have that, especially in the beginning. Do you want to comment there at all, Nick, about, I mean, you've dealt with companies coming from universities, any, any challenges or benefits there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm less qualified to, to talk about this, but just from, from our, our perspective, having someone still involved in a university type position whilst building a business, um, the challenges of that are obviously constraints around time and, and bandwidth of, of the individual. But the, the, if this is set up correctly um, in a way that not all of the, the kind of the heavy lifting is left to the person who's trying to run two things. But if that involvement in, around commercialization is uh, on sort of an advisory role or a, a role that is just very cognizant of the, of the, the draws of being still in, involved in academia, I think it's massively useful and, and, and brings massive um, advantages by having someone with the ear on the ground to what the latest science is and the developments where I mean, that's essentially a large part of a, an academic researcher's job is understanding the global kind of, Ben mentioned it, being part of this community of, of researchers. I think that's vital. When you leave academia, you, unfortunately, you do lose that, that kind of direct line. Um, so I would say that the advantage is that you have this direct line into the latest science. The disadvantage, or, or should I say the balance that needs to be struck, is around the expectations of building a startup um, whilst doing something else, I think it's very difficult to do. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I do wanna wrap up here and keep everybody to our time. Uh, I think there's a question here about uh, opportunities for undergrads. And I think it speaks to actually this. I, I'm part of the reason that I'm at Launch Lab is because we are affiliated with the university. And speaking to Peter Thiel's quote there, you need a lot of really smart people at a, thrown at a very hard problem to figure this thing out. I think what we found is that there's 31,000 really smart people at Stellenbosch University. Some subset of that really want to be involved in entrepreneurism. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do is give people a very low risk way to try entrepreneurism. So I would say go to our website, uh, www.launchlab.coza, go to SU Entrepreneurship Hub. You're going to see, or even vac or our, our team, and you're going to see vacancies for fellowships. You're going to see different student pitch competitions. You're going to see opportunities for internships. So potentially you could even work with Ben on his team. You could work with Nick on his team. So we want to find low risk ways to pair people 
with entrepreneurs, investors, give them a go at entrepreneurism so they can see what it feels like and, and get that experience because they could use smart people. You want to give it a go. So it's a, hopefully a pretty symbiotic relationship. So again, want to really thank the science faculty, um, Dean Varnick and the, and the entire team there have really stuck up their hand and said, we want to be part of this entrepreneurial pursuit. We want to bring this type of information to our faculty. So want to thank them for that effort and really big, big hands or big, uh, big, big clap for both Ben and Nick here to make time out of their day to give a really interesting perspective and to really show people that this path is possible. You have to put one foot in front of the other. You have to take one step forward every day. I loved hearing Ben's long journey. And this isn't something that happens overnight. It's probably not something you woke up one morning and said, let's do it. But it is a journey that you're going on. And then hearing about Nick, and I think we really heard a lot about grit and perseverance there as well. Knowing what you want to do, persevering, pursuing it, no matter what it is, because it matters to you, is if I can say anything about entrepreneurism, that's it. It's a calling. It's not a job. If it really appeals to you and it's something that you feel like you have to be doing, then give it a go. And we're hopefully here to help you try to do that. So thanks again. Uh, I will try to, I'll take all the questions that were unanswered because there's really good questions there and we will follow up with you as well. So make sure that you know those questions will be answered. Ben, Nick, science faculty, thank you so much. Have a great night. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining.